Today I'm up at the main edible acres site, our six acre site in Trumansburg, New York. It's been uh, going on for about 10 years now. And we have a random thaw here. Today it's 45, almost 50 degrees. We've had cold and snow for a bit. Lots of moisture in the ground, fair bit of precipitation in the last few days. And so I was planning to take a walk on the high point of this property where there are a lot of hand dug ponds and waterways and assess them and think about them. And I thought I would take folks along if you're interested. So stick around if that seems compelling. Right now I'm walking roughly due west by southwest and I'm aiming to the far southwest corner of this property, which is the high point of the landscape here. It's a good place to look at the water table, see how it's expressing, see how water's moving or being held. Um, it gives me some information about where to be able to send water from a high point in the landscape. And so I'm gonna aim just over to here. That's around the highest point that I can actually do some work in and we'll see what's going on. This opening in here back in 2008, when my family first invested in this property, if you can imagine was 100% closed canopy with Scott's pine. Uh, I cleared it in the year 2010 uh, using uh, chainsaws and some hand tools and made hugel mounds way back in the day, basically laid the logs uh, all throughout this area, very rough sketches of where gardens would be and took the brush and laid them up as you can see on the Western boundary property line as a brush wall to help uh, as a wind catch, as habitat, etc. And then this summer, pretty major stroke of uh, change in the landscape. A friend of mine bartered with me where I gave him a whole bunch of young bare root orchard trees, peaches and the like, in exchange for borrowing for three days uh, a BCS, so to walk behind tractor with a rotary plow. And I went through this area uh, with some friends, with my good friend Juan and my lovely wife Sasha, and we shaped this area up into basically islands of soil, uh, knowing that this area was prone towards wetness. Maybe someday this actually would be a pond site, but for now uh, we shaped it up into these larger contiguous super raised beds. So for example, this one directly in front of us, you can see the remnants of old logs. These are now nine year old rotting logs from trees that were cut down. Some of them are buried, some of them are revealed. And for the most part at this point, especially with the, with the rotary plow, when it hit one of them, it would just dissolve into bits. And so there's a lot of wood and organic matter in these islands. And rather than making them the exact raised bed sizes we thought they should be uh, in the long run, it's kind of like a rough sketch of larger blocks. And this way we can watch how the water works because we dug the pathways. The pathways are where the water are now. This is probably only going to be a few months out of any growing season that it's this wet, but it'll be interesting to monitor and watch. But by having more water held in the walkways in the landscape, there's room for water to bleed out from these beds. Our soils tend to be uh, very saturated, so it's going to be a better drain situation. The interesting bit with this context is that, uh, so now I'm looking more towards west again. If I look up into the canopy to the south, you'll see it's a fair bit of closure. There's still Scott's Pine canopy, in part because I have these funky experimental buildings I made back in the day, and it's nice to keep them in the shade and sheltered. Uh, but that southern canopy of pine creates a shaded context in here. So it remains to be seen how to design this out and figure out what it moves into, but wet-ish tolerant, shade-ish tolerant, deer and rabbit resistant. It'd be fun to share notes on what we come up with in here. I imagine this whole area having a lot of Mioga perennial ginger in it. We'll see. From this high point, we can move down a bit and see one of the first hand dug ponds I worked on a number of years ago. Actually, some of the earlier videos that I made, I'll link to a few of them here, where I talked about the building of the experimental cob structures basically a classroom in the woods where I was trying to figure these things out as I went. And this pond provided the silty, sandy, clayey material mixed with straw and provided some of the water to do the cobbing work of those structures. So pretty close by 
And now it becomes a really nice place to hold water high in the landscape. And today in particular is a nice day to look at the design of some of the overflow elements of this. Knowing that our landscape is prone towards excessive wetness, we kind of need to know where to send it. And so over the years, I've been sculpting and shaping this minor trench that you can see, even though it is flowing, it's at a low rate of flow. And I know that because I'm not seeing turbidity, I'm not seeing bits floating in the water uh, or rushing, but I can, you know, scuff the water a little and watch where things flow. And they're moving ever so gently in this direction. Um, and it's an opportunity to look at these overflow channels, perhaps use a shovel to muck them out a bit, harvest some silt to put near other gardens. And also in the midwinter here during a random thaw like this, it's an opportunity to look at obstructions that may have fallen in, like branches or debris or mud. The voles tend to do a lot of their own water work decision making and things like this you know, random hay bale chunk that's dropped in there. But maybe I'm gonna leave that and watch to see if we accumulate silt on this side of that, that'll be easy to harvest and bring up onto a bed. I'll leave it for now because I'm not seeing the walkway flooding. If we move from that small first pond in the landscape to another area that is around equal elevation, perhaps just a little bit lower, uh, we come into this area of a whole lot of micro ponds. And I've talked about this set of ponds in another video. I'll link to that here. Um, these are two, for the most part, they're two ponds on the larger enough side that I can pull water from them either in the fall or the early spring before they start to start to dry down a little bit. I've worked on trying to seal them with bentonite clay. Uh, I think over time with organic matter, they'll get tighter, but I'm also learning to not sweat it too much and uh, use the water extensively in the time of year when we're establishing plants, get a deep, deep mulch on those plants, and then let them figure it out for themselves. Uh, but one thing that, uh, definitely a couple of things that I see that are interesting here, is again, part of looking at this thaw is how clean is the water? How clear is it? And I'm seeing pretty good clarity. That to me is a good indication that the water's moving slowly and gently. It's being filtered as much as possible in this landscape. Um, in this pond, I'll come back to this probably next summer. Uh, my friend Andy helped me out. You can see this stick down in the bottom of the pond. We used a post hole digger to go down yet another foot or two. And we set in an old metal 55 gallon drum that we can set a solar panel on the bank and a bilge pump down in there and draw water up and out into what will be an experimental pallet-based water holding system. We'll see how that one goes, but maybe we can hold two or 3,000 gallons of water in that. I'll leave that alone until we actually have some more information to share. It's interesting to see in a new opening here, this is actually just a, two, three months ago, we went through and cleared a few more Scots pine. You can see the rough sketch of these hugel mounds, very coarse woody debris on them. So this was all done this fall and both branches and bottoms were laid into where uh, future garden beds will be. It's the least amount of moving, least amount of processing. And then you can see to some extent, some soil was applied on top uh, where we can seed out in the spring to very fast growing crops. And if those take to put in transplants or starts of squash to run these mounds for year one, and we're getting that soil by digging another small pond right here. This is an interesting example. This was worked on, I wanna say three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and very different picture, very, very cloudy. This is very young. There's no real organic matter. Uh, or, or living plant life, aquatic plant life, that's filtering and drawing this silt out. It's what a lot of ponds in the world look like. Uh, so we're looking forward to inoculating that with some great perennial uh, water-loving plants. And what I tried to do is before this started filling with water is dig it down to the depth we wanted and take that subsoil and put it right here. It's a small distance. And then we can use that subsoil throughout the season 
to bank around other plants, to stool layer, to mulch. It's not the most nutrient dense, but it's something. And it allowed us to get to the depth we were hoping for in this little pond. It's a little crazy to see this area. We're only a few feet away from that last little pond. Um, again, a lot of heavy lifting here with the BCS and the rotary plow, running it back and forth through the walkways and then taking the softer soil to build these permanent broad raised beds. And this bed is about five or six feet wide in its widest, and four feet in its narrowest, probably about 30 feet long, a minor walkway, and then a slightly smaller bed. And then a lot of room for water to escape through this landscape. So these beds that you see here, one, two, three, freshly built this summer, set to a cover crop of radishes and mustards, and then planted out to our production garlic this fall and mulch deeply. Looking forward to seeing how that performs. I feel like it's really excellent drainage. We got a good amount of mulch on there. We added in some trace minerals and lots of compost from our chicken yard. I'll share some updates on how that garlic works in basically these islands of fertility in this otherwise very flat and pretty sodden landscape. There's a similar picture coming out uh, all throughout here that wherever we've dug down in order to build up beds we're seeing just how high the ambient water table is at certain times of year. If this was all flat soil and we planted the garlic directly in, uh, the bottom of their bulbs or of their cloves where their roots would be starting to form would definitely be sitting in water right now. I think they can survive that, but it, it's a great way to ask for disease pressure. And so it's a lot of work to do that initial trenching and digging and moving of all this soil. But once it's done, it's relatively stable. And I have no intention ever, ever in a million years running a rotary plow or a rototiller through any of these beds. It's a one-time disturbance. Um, it took about two gallons of gas in total to make many thousands of square feet of beds on this end of the property. Uh, and we'll manage them with broad forks from here. I really look forward to seeing how they perform. This waterway, this is kind of the main canal of drainage. We're in a minor valley that runs to the north and slightly east, basically on contour. This trench continues on down through the landscape so that there's a bleeder valve to allow excess water to move onward following that natural fold down and along. So water that peaks through this channel will ultimately be able to leave, but it'll be interacting with a lot of gardens on its way. It's been interesting putting in a lot more effort on this far end of the property over the last few years. We're on, like I said before, the high point of the property, the highest point in our watershed, creating as much physical texture in this landscape as possible so we get as much production space as we can. We can manage and uh, encourage the water to move in certain directions, acknowledge that it will need to be released in certain areas. And all the while, when we have water moving through a system like this, any leached fertility from these gardens can gently be carried by water down through the rest of the landscape. And so over the years, the goal will be how do we incorporate more and more orchards and plantings and nutrient loving productive crops down watershed from this area, maybe more zone three, zone four-ish, less uh, intimate interactions as we move back into the woods and on our way to leaving this property. But that can happen a little bit later. We're setting up the infrastructure now in a more thorough and deep way for some serious food and nursery production in what is, I would guess, about an acre and a half opening now. And again, if you can imagine, this was almost entirely closed canopy a number of years ago, uh, cleared with chainsaw and hand tools, a lot turned into charcoal, a lot buried under soil in Hugel Mound, and a lot laid up as brush walls and debris for wildlife and for wind filtration and snow catching. So lots of labor, but none of it super complex and all of it slow and iterative and taking many years to get to here and many more years to come. Thanks for watching us. We'll do some more interesting tours or maybe interesting tours of other areas as time allows.